and the recording has started. Okay. Well, welcome to the uh, presentation. Uh, I hope you uh, will find it very useful. Um, my name is Jeff Miller, and I'm the Director of Project Management uh, for Interstates Control Systems. I'm also uh, currently the Treasurer for CSIA, and have been on the board um, for uh, was on for the board on the board for four years prior to becoming treasurer, as well as have been on best practices committee for 12 uh, plus years, and was chairman of that committee for four. Um, uh, and uh, certainly enjoy working with CSIA and have and learned a lot and how to uh, more successfully run our business. And uh, so I really want to kind of. Uh, make sure that you all know we're we're here to uh, uh, work you through uh, kind of what it's like to build a professional project management organization. A little different than just uh, being a uh, having project managers, and that's kind of where where I'm going to go with this today. This is the fourth um, in a series of uh, seven uh, webinars that we've had in the. The series is called Proactive Leadership in a Rapidly Changing Landscape, and I, I know many of you have probably joined uh, on several of the other webinars. Um, I'm going to uh, also have a presentation at the annual conference, and I think pretty much all of the webinar uh, presenters are going to do that as well. So this is kind of a lead-in to, um, to our uh, annual conference this coming year. So um, just to kind of give you a little history of the, this is the series that we've been working through. Uh, the first three, um, the first one was the holistic overview of proactive management. I'm going to pull up one of the slides that Nick Setchell uh, used in his presentations in just a minute, and I'm, I'm going to feed into some of the information that he provided us then. Um, organizational culture, methods for improving performance, the 24-month rolling plans, which was last month. Ours is the uh, professional project management team for systems integration. And then there's three other webinars that will be coming, uh, hiring, leading, coaching, and evaluating, talking about your people, um, and then performance management for technical professionals, and then this J-curve uh, management. And um, J-curve management was one of the topics that Nick, Nick had at our annual conference last year, and I'm looking forward to hearing some more about that again. So um, this is one of the slides that Nick used, and basically um, when, you, when you think about his presentation about holistic overview of proactive management, that's what this slide is really showing. There's, there's this, these quadrants of your business, the foundation, market, people, and operations. And then he kind of filled in a few places on this, uh, like showing where the different webinars uh, fit into that. And you'll see down in the bottom, this one fits under the operations side of things. So it's, the, it's building an efficient model for project management. Uh, it's part of your operations piece, but a very important uh, part of operations. So um, I'm just going to cover a couple of things that I think were key to his, present, his first presentation that I think very much relate to project management. Um, the first of which is the rate of change is a lot faster than we've seen in the past. And, you know, many of us have been in the business for a lot of years. And I think um, when I heard that from him, I, I felt like, yeah, I really agree with that. This is, this is something that um, every year that goes by, it seems like the change gets faster and faster. The, the second item that I pulled out that I thought I really need to tie in with project management is uh, under your people. It was another one of his quadrants. And he stated uh, effective communication and performance skills, if you do not have those, you risk suffocating your business. Uh, so I thought that was very important. And then under operations, um, having high quality and timely output was something that he mentioned. And he said if you don't do that well, you have a risk of choking your business. Um, so I thought those were too important, and, and I'm going to really try to relate those back to project management in general. So why do we worry about project management? Um, as a PM or the PMs that are in your company, they really try to 
provide focus to this to um, this highly effective communications and stakeholder management. And I'm going to use some terms that that um, you know we don't often use in the industry, saying stakeholder. It's you know those that are involved in the project. But you'll see why in a minute when we get to developing this around a global standard, and that's some of the terminology that you'll hear in that global standard. The uh, the second thing is high quality project outputs in those time frames that we've agreed on. And this agreeing happens across all the stakeholders that are involved in the project. So again, if I just pull that one slide back out, does this sound familiar? He said effective communication and performance skills were important and high quality and timely output. So risk of suffocating, risk of choking your business. Now. I, I found that very interesting because I went out and pulled some studies and, and that's where we'll kind of go next. But I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, this slide. Um, the first, uh, the first one off on the left here, how the customer explained what they needed, uh, how the business consultant described it with the nice little easy chair in the swing, how the analyst designed it and obviously makes no sense, but neither does the way the programmer actually programmed it. Um, and then how the customer was billed for it and what they really wanted out of it. And this is really key to project management. In fact, I think most of you would say this one in the middle here, how the customer was billed, that's typically how we make it, but they probably paid for what this, uh, what they really wanted. So, uh, it's important for us to, to manage our projects and I thought that was just a, a neat il illustration as to how typical projects go. So why is um, project management needed? And this is the study I was referring to just a minute earlier. Um, I, I went through a lot of different studies, but most will show that 20 to 30 percent of all projects fail, and another 40 percent of those will have some form of major challenge. And when when a project fails, it doesn't necessarily mean that you you lost a ton of money on it, but it didn't meet all the objectives that the project set out to meet in the in the beginning. But a project failure, obviously many of us have had those, and I think we would all agree that uh, our numbers may be slightly different, but at times um, we've got projects that fail and they and others that have major challenges. This was an interesting statistic. Um, large projects, ones that are a million dollars plus, have a higher failure rate than those that are less than 350,000. Um, and I actually went back and looked at um, at our list and to try to determine, you know, how many projects that we have because we used to say, well, the big projects, those are the ones that we always do well on, and we've got a lot of room for recovery. But one of the things that I found was a lot of those larger projects were ones that if they hit the, we call it the killer job list. Um, if they hit that list, they certainly kill your net income at the end of the year a lot faster than the others. But they would say as many as 40% of those that are larger like this in the IT realm, and that's where I kind of got most of this information, um, more than 40% or at 40 will fail. And also in large IT projects, 17% of them threaten the survival of the business. Um, so obviously that's something we need to pay attention to if it's going to if a project is going to kill our business uh we need to manage it well um another thing that was related to IT projects in the US only 50 billion to 150 billion dollars is lost annually to projects that fail to meet their objectives so if you're really going to want to grow your business you've got to get your PM processes under control and that's kind of where, where I'll be going with this uh, webinar today. How do you build around your PM processes with a professional project management team? So obviously these aren't going to be anything new to you. These are key functions that a project manager performs. They're communications managers, they're scope managers, they're risk managers, um, they're quality managers, and resource managers, and I threw in the, the term psychologist in there, and actually I got that from 
uh, Nick Setchell as well. And how many times do we wind up being the psychologist on uh, with our team members when things aren't going so well? Um, you know, we have to be sometimes the cheerleader on the project. Um, and we're the ones that are making sure that the the train stays on the track. And I, I think those are certainly key functions. Obviously, there's other things but that a project manager does, but I thought these are the ones that, that I tend to focus on the most as a project manager. So uh, then I, you know, I need to talk a little bit about uh, what does it mean to, be, to have a professional project management organization. And um, to, to do that, um, you build it around a global standard. And um, I, I found this to be, I, at first I thought it was going to be really tough to do because the global standard um, doesn't seem to always apply to the things that we do. But I'm going to show you a little bit on, in a few minutes here how to apply uh, a global standard to your PM processes and, and make it make sense. Um, you're going to have to push your PM skill set to a different level. It's not, um, and I think I actually, you know, it's, it's my project management work is my main job, not just extra responsibilities. And I know many of us as our businesses, the smaller we are and the newer we are in building our businesses, you know, our engineers are our PMs and they're, they're the ones that are trying to take on that role. And, and I know many of you will agree with me that it, oftentimes it feels like that's just my extra work. I just got to do that in addition to getting all my engineering work. And um, one of the things that Interstates has done uh, more recently is built this project management organization that allows us to make that our main job. And um, we'll walk through a little bit of that in a bit here too. But then building a way to measure how our PMs are doing at delivering projects uh, specific to their skill sets. And um, so if you've got, I don't, if your company has a pay for performance or some form of a bonus system, really set up your PM performance measures around their skill sets uh, so that you're, you're giving them the, uh, the ability to, uh, to be measured off of and obtain their bonuses based on how they're performing their PM skills. And I think that's very important because, you know, you get what you measure, number one. Uh, most of us would agree with that. And then this gives them some ability to know what we're going to measure them against. Um, so I'm, I'm a big Dilbert fan, and I, I found this one. I thought this was pretty interesting and certainly not professional project management work. Um, you can see uh, I, I need a description of your project and its projected costs. Well, that's impossible. Project uncertainty principle says that if you if you understand a project, you won't know its cost and vice versa. You just made that up. That doesn't make it wrong, does it? So it's just interesting, you know, how some people think of project management is it's kind of voodoo. Um, and at times it feels kind of like voodoo. So uh, we are uh, we are doing things that aren't natural to us, especially those of us that are engineers and we're moving into that role. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a, a little bit about what this global standard is, and and uh, you can see on on here I have both the CSIA best practices as well as the Project Management Institute. Um, Project Management Institute is one that is obviously it's a global standard. Um, they have what they call the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or PMBOK, as you'll hear it referred to more frequently. Um, and that's a global standard, something that, that um, project managers can be certified against. They can take a, a certification exam to prove that they understand those. And we'll talk a little bit more about certification in just a bit. Uh, the CSIA uh, best practices, Section 5, which is really the whole project management section in our best practices manual, is another one of those things uh, that's a it's got global standard, and one of the reasons it is is because uh, we actually built Section 5 when we were working on Revision 3 of uh, the Best Practices Manual. We built it around the, the PMBOK uh, model, 
so you'll see that there are definitely some similarities there for um, for PMBOK and the best practices section five. Um, what, one of the things that if you start talking about PMBOK is Project Management Institute or PMI as it's referred to. It has a lot of resources that your project managers can uh, tap into. They have free electronic books um, on their website. If you're a member of PMI, you've got access to lots of different training, whether it's webinars um, or actual training providers uh, that that really are PMI certified trainers. Um, and we'll get into a little bit in a little bit how we we kind of went a little different route in our PMI or PMBOK training and we built it around um, um, we, we kind of built it around a little uh, different method. And I'm going to switch my phone here. It sounds like there's a little bit of distortion here. Hold on just a second. Okay, that should be a little better, I think. Um, so on these uh, on the PMI resources, um, there's a lot of different things you can get involved in. If you're a if you're a PMI member, you just have access to those, and they work uh, they work really well. Um, the CSI best practices, as I mentioned before, are Section 5. We built it on top of uh, the PMI's PMBOK um, and all of the audited items that are actually in Section 5 are supported by PMBOK. So you won't find uh, that there's a lot of different challenges there if you decide to build your project management uh, methodology and those types of things on top of uh, you know, if you try to build it on 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 top of PMBOK, it's going to fit right into how CSI's uh, certification works for Section 5. And um, I'll just throw a plug in for the best practices as well. Certainly, something that um, that we've gotten a tremendous amount of help from uh, by being involved in uh, uh, the committee itself and helping develop some of those best practices. But but yet going through the certification process and really uh, working our systems up to the level of how CSIA has built their best practices manual around. And, and that was a huge help for us. So what I'm, I'm going to kind of cover here is, you know, if you if you think about PMBOK, though, PMBOK is very theoretical. Um, so you you don't necessarily want, you know, I could I could give that training to my PMs and it's not necessarily going to help them deliver my projects better. So Interstates decided we're going to do PMBOK style project management training, but we're going to we're going to really just take those knowledge areas. And currently there are ten knowledge areas. When we did it, there were only nine. The uh, revision five actually came out with a tenth one now, uh, but we customized that to our project delivery methodology. And so any area, scope management, for instance, we took scope management and we said, here's what PMBOK's definition of scope management is. How do we apply it at Interstates? And that's how we went through our, uh, built our training modules. And it was a huge benefit to us. And uh, we'll talk about some of those in just a, a little bit. but. Really, it, you can't just leave it at that theoretical level. You have to build around some type of a project application theme. One of the things that we did, we just took a kind of a standard project, um, and we decided uh, we're gonna we're gonna take each module, each of the knowledge areas, and we're gonna it, it, during the training we're gonna take uh, this sample project, and we're gonna say, all right, how would we build the scope? Um, how would we ensure that we are developing and managing scope on this project? And, you know, again, it was very familiar information from the project side to this PM group, but yet the theory that we were bringing in was we were trying to help them understand, here's what PMBOK says you should do for scope management, now how would we do it in our world? And it was just a big benefit to us to do it that way. Spread it out over, we, we decided we took about six months to do the entire training module. And we basically uh, were taking one to two of the knowledge areas per 
uh, usually two per session. And then there's some there's there's three chapters at the very beginning of PMBOK that are just really theory, and we kind of covered them in one session. And then we got into each of the knowledge areas, and that was a big help to us. Then abs absolutely the best thing that we did after we finished our training was um, once we completed it, we assembled a team to build a list of our common practices that that relate to each of the knowledge areas. And I'm actually going to show you an example of that in just a little bit here. But um, the, the goal was, you know, we need a way to know, you know, how does that relate to us? So, so we looked at these, these uh, 10, actually 10 knowledge areas now, and you can see they start with, they're very familiar things that you're, you know your project managers need to be involved in. Integration management is probably the one that's kind of more, uh, it's a term that we don't hear very frequently, but it's, it's really more building your overall project plan and keeping it integrated together well. Scope management, time management, cost management, quality, human resources, communications, risk, uh, procurement, which was, you know, for a standard project um, in an automation world, I didn't think much about procurement, but once we got into the procurement management module, yeah, we, we sometimes procure subcontractors. We, we uh, procure a lot of material for our job, so it made sense for that to be part of our methodology and and think about it from that. And then the last one that's brand new that we haven't actually incorporated into our training module yet is called stakeholder management. It's a brand new module. I still need to get in there and, and uh, dig around in it a bit and see how it might relate to us. But it's really, a, it relates to a lot of the others like communications management. But ultimately, I think it'll be a, a nice one to add. We're, we're building our uh, training, we usually do that about every three years. We have enough new people at that point that we redo our PMBOK training. And uh, next year will probably be our, 2014 will be our next uh, training session. So here's some benefits that we got out of using this PMBOK style training. Number one, we definitely built a common project management terminology across lots of teams, many different PMs. We did this with our construction group, uh, with our instrumentation group, with our controls and our engineering group. So we had all of our different kinds of PMs together. We now all use the same terminology, and I, that was a huge benefit to us. Um, we developed kind of uh, what we, we actually call it PM excellence, but we built, built our standards related to PMBOK, um, and we said, PM excellence is how we're going to use that. And we basically, I will actually give you an example of that in a second. But our, our goal was take these knowledge areas, decide what they mean to each one of us, and develop a list of minimum expectations for every one of those knowledge areas that every one of our PMs is going to, to use. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that our clients were saying, you know, it, it really, We've got now, um, between all of our interstates companies, I think we have 13 uh, PMPs, project management professionals, that have taken the exam. And every year we get several more. Um, and that's been a big benefit as we've met with our clients. Uh, they definitely see that our project managers are very serious about managing projects and, uh, and that it is their job. Uh, and that's what, they do, that's what they do for a living now. Um, so I've mentioned the term PM excellence a couple of times, uh, so I'm going to kind of explain what we did with that. Um, we defined every one of the PMBOK knowledge areas, and we said this is what it means to us as a company. And even though there were there are four business units inside our company, and we all think of scope management slightly different, maybe. Uh, we might have different tactics as to how we define scope, but each of us has a theme around what we want scope management to mean. And I'll actually, I will use that as an example in just a second to show you how we did that. But we defined every one of those knowledge areas and what they meant to us. We defined what the outcomes would look like. Um, so, 
what do we really want out of scope management? What, what's ultimately the goal with that? So the outcome is really what we're after, but then we also defined kind of a minimum expectations of activities that needed to be performed in each of those levels or areas, which we said would then, our assumption would be that if we do these activities, we will get the outcome that we're looking for. But yet, part of that is we need to audit. So we built a kind of a little bit of an audit system, each of those areas that we're, that we're building into our systems once a quarter uh, gets a random audit and um, and basically once they pass certain percent complete they get a say at 30 percent complete they get randomly audited we pick certain projects and we say all right show us how you're doing scope management what are you doing and we have very specific questions that we ask and they're yes no very concrete answers, again, related to activities, and our assumption is those activities will get us the performance that we're looking for. So, but one of the things that we need to do is reevaluate if the activities are actually helping us attain those desired outcomes. So from the audit results, we can tell, are they following the activities that we said they needed to do? If they are, and we're not obtaining the outcomes we need, we need to modify our activities. So this has been a big process for us. We've had, uh, most of these have been in, in place now for upwards of um, uh, a year to, some of them just a year, some of them a year and a half. But uh, we continue to, uh, like this new module that came out on stakeholder management, we'll have to build some activities around that once we've determined how we want to apply it. Uh, but this is an actual example of of how we determined, um, you know, how we built this this around how we're gonna how we're gonna develop project scope management. So you can see at the top of this, we took the definition right out of PMBOK. What does it say scope management is? So it, it includes these things: collecting requirements, defining scope, creating a work breakdown structure verifying scope and controlling scope. Well, that's all good and fine, but how are we going to do that? What are we really after here? So ultimately what we said, our goal is to ensure that the leaders of the project team fully understand, thoroughly validate, and document the scope of work before beginning to build the deliverables of the project. And scope must be continuously monitored and controlled throughout the duration of the project. So if you go back up and look at the definition, we incorporated all the things that PMBOK would say you need to do, but we just kind of gave a, a big overall interstate's goal as to what we think scope management means to us. And then we have some tactics underneath project scope management that are the activities that we say uh, will help us obtain this goal. And we did that for each of the nine knowledge areas. And this has been a huge help for um, kind of building this project management team to a level of consistency. Uh, since all the project managers will get audited at some point um, on their projects, uh, this, you know, it shows whether we're consistently applying our activities, which we are saying will help us reach our goal. And we've had uh, so far have not had to change activities that would tell us uh, that those things aren't what we needed. Um, one of the key things to that we've, as interstates have decided we want to do is we're going to build our, our professional project management organization by getting as many of our PMs, PMP certified project management professionals as possible. And this is something that we kind of just said, for us, it proves that project management is my profession. Now, I might still be an engineer and I still understand those things that are related to the engineering portion of what we do, but we've actually found great value in even finding uh, project managers that are PMP certified that don't know anything about controls. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but we built what we decided to do was we're going to get a group of people certified 
So we had some internal study groups. Um, each time we do this PMBOK training, every three years, we're going to have a large group of people that start off in this in these study groups, and we'll probably, you know, if there were 20 people in the study groups, uh, at least eight of them are going to go ahead and take the exam when it's all said and done. The others likely will by the time they get to the, the next set of study groups. Um, but one of the things that we do there is we set the exam date for that entire group uh, early so that they have a timeline that they need to work against. And uh, that helps to maintain the accountability of, of getting the studying done. Um, one other thing that we found to be helpful is you can send a couple of guys off to these boot camp style um, PMP training classes. And they actually are a week long typically and at the end of the week, they can take the exam as long as they have all their criteria met ahead of that. And then we use those PMPs when they come back from something like that. We use them to help lead study groups for other groups uh, of those that are wanting to. But really, you know, we really don't want to pay $5,000 to send everybody through that necessarily. Uh, although it has been very helpful because everybody who's done the boot camp style has passed the exam the first round. So that's been a, a big deal for us. This is a this is actually an interesting slide because I didn't realize how many uh, project management professionals there are around the world. Um, <clears throat> this actually was was a 2010 slide, but at that time there were almost uh, 400,000 PMPs globally, and they were growing um, at a rate of 4,300 PMPs a month and 51,600 per year. So that what they were estimating they'd be at about 550,000 uh, PMPs worldwide uh, by 2013 and I actually looked for that number to see if they what their estimate was and I couldn't couldn't find it but they were they were keeping up with this with this stat. So I think we're I, I don't imagine they're too far off from this. <clears throat> but it just goes to show how globally recognized that standard is. So one of the uh, the big things for this, excuse me, <clears throat> the um, it does require PM experience before they can uh, actually set for the exam. <clears throat> so if you have a two-year degree, you need five years of experience uh, doing project management type work or 7,500 hours, man hours, of PM experience. So the five years is what they say it takes typically for a PM to get 7,500 hours of uh, PM experience. And that is documented hours. You have to actually fill out a form uh, for every one of the man hours that you're going to put in. And it could be a project that had, you know, a thousand uh, project management type man hours in it, but you have to have enough projects over that five years that you can document this 7,500 hours. If you've got a four-year degree, it's three years of experience, 4,500 hours of PM experience. And they do have to have at least 35 hours of formal PM education. And what Interstates actually did here, um, we we actually put uh, this as a, a uh, we had um, this PMBOK class that we put on we sent the information off to PMI and got it certified so that we could count it as this 35 hours of education. It doesn't take too much to get it certified. If it follows PIMBAC format, you're very likely um, going to be able to, um, uh, to get that to work. So um, we, we didn't have any difficulty on our side. And then uh, the, the PMI membership is, you know, if you join PMI, then you get access to all of these things and you have to be a member the year that you test is you don't necessarily have to maintain the membership but I would encourage doing it because we gain uh, the, a lot of those resources that PMI has have been very helpful for us as we uh, we really like to get better at risk management let's go look and see what what um, resources PMI has got for that so that's been a big help for for us <clears throat> um, one of the things that we actually did for our control systems group here is, is um, I went outside the group 
And, um, you know, I took, I kind of put my neck out on the, on the chopping block and said, I'm going to go out and hire a project management professional, um, PM. And I was looking for a software PM, uh, someone who had been in the software industry and developed, you know, been around that, but not an engineer, not a programmer per se, but someone who was, had been delivering for, for several years, um, that, you know, and, this actually worked out uh, very well for us. Uh, he's been here for a year and a half now and doing an excellent job. I actually have hired my second one now that's uh, outside PM and also doing very well. And uh, they, are, they are so focused on project management as their profession, uh, the, the project communications went up almost immediately on projects and within weeks of implementing them into the first project I had people saying I'll take this guy on my project anytime uh, so you know again I I probably sheltered the first one a little bit too long uh, kept him off of projects and had him working with alongside me on projects for a little bit longer than I certainly than the second one that I hired that did that uh, but it was it was good because I got him more into our terminology, uh, and he understood more what we were doing by the time I handed him his first project. But worked out really good. Again, your your focus is not on programming or engineering per se. It's focusing on key PM skill sets. If you remember back from some of the earlier slides, uh, communications management. Um, and delivering quality outputs on the time frames that uh, that we need and that our customers are expecting that's what it what it really boils down to what our customers want from us and that's what these guys really focus on uh, this has been a huge benefit for our project teams um, the uh, even our regular team meetings have uh, have been able to be shortened because we're we're, we're short, succinct. We've got meetings all, all scheduled out. We know exactly what we need to cover, uh, and the guys are following up with them, and they're not trying to get into their business as much. And uh, so that's been a, a big benefit to us. And for me, one of the things that has worked very well for me is I joined um, our local Project Management Institute chapter, and I started networking with PMPs because they're – it's going to be this whole meeting will be full of uh, project management professionals. And I started looking for those that, that I saw that had key leadership traits I was looking for. Um, and I, I, you know, as I found those people in the PMI chapter, um, got to know them, joined, you know, found them through LinkedIn, got to know them a little bit better, and eventually wound up hiring um my first one, actually, that's how I wound up hiring him. And it was just, a, you know, it was just from networking at uh, this local PMI chapter event. It was a huge uh, deal for me, and I enjoy doing that networking side of it anyway, and that's one of the reasons I really enjoy uh, our CSI annual conference and uh, would encourage you to attend there. There's just a tremendous amount of networking that you can do there as well. Um, so, you know, this has been a... Uh, uh, Big deal for us. We've we've gotten a tremendous amount of uh, a benefit from doing it that way. Um, now, one of the things you do need to consider, though, if you're going to get your PMs uh, PMP certified, they will just like a professional engineer. You have to have certain amount of uh, professional development units or continuing ed education units every three years is the way they do their cycle, and you have to have 60. PDUs every three three years, so it's a it's a long term commitment from you as an employer to keep them certified. But one of the benefits that that we found is that it keeps us learning. Um, our our team members continually are learning more about how others are doing project management. <clears throat> so it gives us better project application. Um, you know, we get a lot of our training through this, uh, the local PMI chapters. Um, the, um, th this you get for every month that they attend the meeting, they get a one PDU. Uh, for our chapter, once a year, they do, an, uh, they do a, um, 
what they call a PDU conference, which is a bunch of speakers coming in, giving talks on project management topics uh, related to how they do it at their business. And that's typically eight PDUs for that. So you get a, there's a lot of different ways that you can get that. You can also get, if you attend webinars on PMI's, PMI's website or do book reviews, as long as you claim that um, on their site, that all counts towards your 60 PDU. So I've never had any issue um, maintaining mine. I've, uh, you can carry over if you get more PDUs in a, in a three-year cycle, you can carry over into the next year. Um, so typically, by the time I'm two years in, I've already got my 60 P PDUs accumulated and accumulating some for the next three-year cycle. So it's typically not very hard. And again, one of the best benefits that, that I have found is that it's, we're keeping our project management team well-trained. It's not just the way Interstates does it. We're hearing how other com companies are doing things and we're being able to take those and apply those things into our organization. Um, so I've got a, a couple of things I wanted to, I wanted to kind of make sure we have plenty of time to ask some questions with this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the floor up to um, any kind of questions we've got, and I'll have some wrap up things that I wouldn't mind covering as well. But let's open up for some questions here, see if anybody's got anything that they would uh, like for me to try to cover. Jeff, I'm going to open up uh, on mute uh, the one who called in. If any of you who called in have a question, I'm going to unmute you. You're going to be able to do that. Okay. All right. And you can also um, uh, send the chat over if you've got a question that you wouldn't mind asking about this. All right. I, one of the things that um, I'll kind of go back to just to, for a for a second here. Uh, this I know is a big deal for a lot of a lot of our um, people out there, um, and and so you know there is a there's a big uh, um, I, I, even with our engineers. This this happened to be one of those things that again I had to really sell to our team. And uh, I'm actually, I'm gonna come back to this in just a second. I did get a question that came in. Um, came in. One of the questions was, how do you in, incentivize or bonus your PMs? Um, so again, as I started out earlier, we built these modules around uh, PM excellence. Uh, so all of our PMs are, are audited at least four times a year. Uh, typically they wind up, um, four to six times a year, they'll have an audit on um, multiples of their projects. And during those audits, we're, we score the PM on how well they're following the activities that we said, these are the minimum level of activities. And one portion of their, we call it pay for performance bonus, is based on how well they followed that. So if, they, if they're hitting an 80% mark, they might get, 80% um, of that, you know, we, we would likely say, you know, 20% of your um, of your bonus is based on this. And customer satisfaction is another big thing that we base a project manager's uh, bonus on. We have um, another one that we work off of is, is related to what we call the quality metrics um, from a post-job review. And we do anything that's got more than uh, $30,000 in in labor man hours, uh, we will we throw that in as a um, you know you're gonna you're gonna have to have a post job review on this, and every one of the PMs then is rated on how well they followed procedure and how how they helped the teams uh, benefit. So we thought that was you know very uh, easy way for us to have some metrics associated with. Um, with that. Um, another question that came in, um, how do you scale PM expectations with project size to uh, minimize the overhead project cost? 
so that's a that's a good point too. We actually we have a group of what we call large project PMs, and they're the ones that are my PMPs, um, and they're going to manage projects from. And we've just kind of uh, randomly said right now anything over fifty thousand in labor revenue um, to whatever whatever the max is, we're going to manage those. Anything under fifty thousand, we kind of we have division managers that manage their own projects. They have their own project teams, um, and they're responsible for developing their own project teams. But we did say early on we're going to have these smaller projects that we're going to have kind of a light methodology for, and those are being managed by these um, either project management assistant or these division managers. So I felt that was a that that really has helped us um, as well. Um, another uh, another one that uh, question that came in: What is your ratio of PMs to other team members within your organization? Um, our company is about 135 uh, employees for uh, for our controls group, and that includes our panel shop and our engineering staff that does. Um, kind of our loop drawings and control panel design. Uh, we've got uh, right now four full-time project managers that that's their only job. Um, and they are not technical at all. The division managers, there'd be another five of those that manage these smaller projects. And But their main job is really not managing projects anymore. We do, however, still do audits with those um, with those PMs. A uh, couple other questions that have come in. Um, what PM software applications are available to manage and track projects? This has been a big deal for us. Uh, we use, um, we've got a, a, an in-house developed kind of SharePoint based, uh, we call it PM Toolbox, but it uses basically SharePoint as the place that we track all of our RFIs and our risk and um, communications to the client and um, all of those types of things. And we we then also have a project server. We use Microsoft Project Professional and we use Project Server. And that's how we track our status on our project. And we actually have our resources do their timesheets directly in Project Server. So they charge their actual work right to the project. But really the biggest piece is this, what we call PM Toolbox, which you can, Project Server actually builds a SharePoint site for each project that has, um, you know, a risk register, um, an RFI, uh, doesn't have RFI out of the box. You can create an RFI module. What we've done is we've kind of built one that really focuses on, um, you know, the, the tools that we want them to use. And so we built lists and uh, libraries inside there that relate to our project delivery methodology. It's been a huge help to us. Again, it gives you one spot that you can go find all of your, um, all of your, I guess, um, uh, forms and tools and everything that's related. And it's all under document control because it's in SharePoint. So that's the other big advantage to that. Uh, another question was, uh, what would be a typical team size uh, when, where we consider putting a project manager on those. And our teams are uh, the, the 50,000 to above projects would normally have like one PLC programmer, one HMI, um, that would be the minimum size, and then an engineer and a drafter from our, from our technical services team, and then our panel shop team. Uh, so you're going to have a minimum of five people on a team to probably – 10 or 12 uh, on a on a very large project. So they, um, you know, we do have a few that might only have one or two people on those, but typically those would be managed by uh, that other group, um, by our, what we call division managers that are doing the small projects. Um, another question came in on the agile methodology. What do you think about agile methodologies for system integration companies? This is actually something that we're looking at right now. Um, we've done, uh, we've got a group of our programmers is more of what I would call high-level language type programmers. They, they write in C-sharp and, and C and 
uh, VB, and we're really looking deep at that agile methodology for that group. Uh, we've not attempted it on any standard automation project uh, per se yet. We've taken a few of those um, tools and applied them to, to what we've kind of felt like our, um, you know, we could use in a, in a delivery methodology. But ultimately, you're going to want to, you know, what we've done is we've kind of adopted, and I, I think I showed it in uh, one of the slides back here and out of, right out of uh, CSI's best practices, is that V type methodology or the system development life cycle, where on the left hand side of the V, you've got your requirements development, your design, your building of the system is way down here, and then the traceability to the actual factory acceptance test and site acceptance test all over here. So you're testing all on this side. And that's been a big help uh, to us for our, for our delivery methodology. But um, certainly Agile, some of the cool things about it is you do see some deliverables a little sooner. Uh, what we've forced our project managers to do is in our, in our time management portion of this, of, of what we do, We've said you need to manage your task down to an 80-hour level. So your schedule will not have any task on it that are larger than 80 hours. And that's been, uh, that's helped us in our both understanding projects better and working with the team to break it down into smaller chunks of time and then being able to, to deliver to that time frame that we need by now, in the, you know, in PMBOK world, they call that the work breakdown structure. Um, so really breaking down your work to a level that is, that is manageable, not if I have a 300-hour task, how do I know when I'm getting close to done with that? So if I break it down to less, 80 or less, I can see it's two weeks' worth of work. I, can, I should be able to get that done in two weeks. That's been a big, uh, big help for us. A um, couple other questions that have that have come in. Uh, do engineers make good PMs in general? Um, well, I, I'll have to, uh, myself, I'm an engineer. Um, I haven't done engineering for a really long time now, but uh, the key issue that we ran into with most of our, and I'm just going to call it technical resources, doing project management was that their natural instincts are to jump into the technical, and I would, I call it getting into the weeds. They get too buried into the weeds to be able to um, to manage the project well, and when they do that, and they will we assign them, you know, they'll have three, four, five projects going at the same time. When we when they dig into the weeds too much, what happens is it winds up they get stuck on one project, and the, all their other projects go to the wayside. So my my opinion is yes, they can be good project managers. They have to be trained to be good project managers. They're not natural at being, not all of us are natural. Some of us just, you know, that's the way we're, we're kind of wired, but um, but that's been, uh, my experience has been, yeah, they can be trained to be good at good project managers, but their natural tendencies will tend to lead them towards jumping in and, and helping the programmers or helping the engineering staff. And that's not what you want your project managers uh, to do. Um, okay, so uh, another question came in on allocation of resources. Um, what, what software package do we use for that, and uh, is it easy to change and manage? Our, our uh, tool is Microsoft Project Server, and it has uh, enterprise resources built into it. So every one of our technical staff is, is in that resource tool. And uh, we're using that then to, uh, uh, to allocate resources to projects. And you can run a report right out of the project server that tells me, you know, this guy's over allocated, he's under allocated, what projects he's associated with. And we manage that on a weekly basis. Every week when we update the schedules, we're looking at that al al allocation of resources. And we tend to look at this week plus two. Uh, we'll, when we set up our original schedule, we'll try to level the resources throughout the entire project, but as the project moves, you're going to have to re-level. So that's a, one of the things that we wind up uh, running into. But we found Project Server to be a, a huge help in that 
environment. It's not a cheap tool to get into, but uh, once you've learned to do it, uh, it's, a, it's really been uh, a great help to us. Uh, a couple other questions that have come in. Um, uh, so the difference between the V methodology and the waterfall methodology, um, really it's just that the way you look at it, all of the, the waterfall methodology still has all of the same task in it. What I really like about the V model is that it shows that you have traceability between your requirements development and your kind of scope development on the left-hand side to your testing on the right hand side so when you build your test plans you're you're having to prove that you met the requirements so it's it's really just a different way of looking at the waterfall methodology it's it has basically the same steps in that um, one of the another question that came in do you do you utilize a full pm on t and m projects or service contracts and that's that's a great question we we don't for service contracts we have a manager our support, um, kind of our service manager, uh, is really listed as the PM uh, for those projects, but we do a minimal amount of, of PM style, style training for that. Uh, they would be more like these small project PMs. And our TNM projects, if they're large enough, we will put uh, one of our project managers on it, uh, one of our large project PMs. They still will, will manage those. Okay, so um, uh, this is a great question too. Uh, what's the typical percentage of project time allocated or budgeted to PM duties uh, as a percent of overall, yeah, overall project time versus project kind of project revenue too? We would um, ultimately tend to probably 12% of, of your project in my in our world, we figure it's about 10 10 percent is pretty common. Uh, is this the time that we allocate of the overall man hours? We're going to have 10 percent more man hours to the project, and and our billable rate for project management was very very similar to our technical resources. Um, we do have we do what we call project management assistance to help with a lot of the scheduling and things like that. And their billable rate is more like an administrative assistant. Um, but that's been a huge help for us in, in really being able to take our, um, take our PM assistants, have them be very much an expert at project and project server and let them handle the schedule while the PM works hard at scope management and risk management in particular. Um, so this one is going to be, uh, this presentation is going to be recorded or is being recorded, so it'll be available that you can take and download and, uh, uh, and, and have some of your other uh, team members uh, listen to it if you would like. Um, how, can, uh, how can you be a good project manager if you, if you don't understand te technical aspects? This is a great, great question. This was the thing I had to really impress on our team. We are depending on our lead technical resource, uh, which is typically a lead programmer or lead engineer, to handle our technical aspects. Now, obviously, the, the project manager, the more they've been with us, they're learning more and more about it. They know the general concepts of how an automation system works. They could not program one line of code. Um, they are, they're not the guy that understands it from that level. It does, uh, we, we will bring in a technical resource at our, um, at our, you know, at a meeting with a client, typically either from, you know, if we're going out on site for a construction meeting, we'll bring one along with us or we'll have them join by phone. But that's a great question because that's exactly what I had to prove to my, to my teams was they do not have to be technical to be able to help manage a project. They are really managing stakeholders and they're managing communication and depending on the team to help develop scope, uh, make sure that we have it defined very well, look at the risk in the project and build risk mitigation plans. It requires that whole team to participate. But we found that 
it's been a huge benefit because the team now realizes, oh, there's a lot more to delivering a project than just, you know, getting my programming work done. Um, and they've really joined and helped a lot from that perspective. And our team members absolutely are bought in 100% to this now. It, it took us a while to get there because it was that proof that we needed to do. But the, the last two PMs that I've hired have no uh, expertise in control systems whatsoever. And both of them, every team they've worked with have said, I'll take them on my project anytime. So huge benefit. And it was a, it was a, that was when I said I put my neck on the line. That was when I was putting my neck on the line right there. <clears throat> um, so the one question was, did the PMs take ownership of uh, guiding programs, drawings, testing? Their whole role is managing the schedule. We put those tasks in the schedule and they're managing the time that it's going to take to do it. Now, we'll have to, they'll have to go through and break down the work into smaller chunks by asking a lot of questions of the team, but that's where their role fits in. They're guiding the development of it by saying this is a task that we need to, we need to accomplish, and we're going to move through those tasks and, uh, and make sure that they're done in the time frame that we need them done in. Okay, there's one, another question here. SharePoint Server has one uh, key developer. Um, everything funnels through for all of uh, Microsoft. There are other alternatives like Basecamp and Huddle. Um, could that work too? Yes, I, we've, we're such a Microsoft house with all of our high-level code development that's in, in, the, you know, in C Sharp and all of that. We, we are a, a, a platinum analysis, or we're probably silver, developer network now, uh, but we've kind of put all of our eggs in that one Microsoft basket really mainly because all of the Microsoft prod products work very well in that environment. So if I have a, um, if I have a uh, Excel spreadsheet, it can be under document control, a Word document, um, all of that, all of those products that you roll into a SharePoint site now are under uh, very easily under uh, version control, and and it really helps when you're looking at what's my latest greatest stuff that's out here. That's how I that's how I go find it um, because of that. So certainly uh, um, easy, you know, it's easy sell for us. But I know that Basecamp and and Huddle are two other really good tools uh, that other integrators are using as well. So certainly don't want to talk them down. I just like the interoperability of of the Microsoft uh, package. Um, uh, any suggestions for time entry for billing and uh, time entry for project status updates? This is actually something that we, I was not going to make my engineers enter their time in two different places. So we built uh, an export utility that grabs the data right out of project server for all my project time and it puts it into a, we actually have a SharePoint timesheet that, that it pulls it into, and then they put their overhead time in that SharePoint timesheet, but they don't have to enter their billable time anywhere but project server. And then we have our, our um, accounting system allows us to export that into a CSV format and import directly into the time module of the system, so it really helps us from that standpoint, we never have to re-enter anything manually. Uh, so if they put their time in, in uh, project server, automatically gets pulled up to the others. Um, I, I think we're, I'm not sure, um, Monica, if we're uh, out of time or if we have time for a few more questions here. I think we have time for a couple of few more Okay. Fine. I'm, I've certainly marked it off on my calendar in case there were some, so I'm certainly willing to Stick around a little longer here. Um, yeah, and, and you know the gentleman that asked about the billing, the time and billing entry, that is a huge deal for for the team members. If they got to enter it in two different places, nobody likes it. And um, we just used our high level language team to build this. They, you know, we we got the database model from uh, the developer site for for Project Server. And then it's a SQL Server backend database, so you can pull the data directly out of Project Server into whatever tool you want without 
hardly any effort uh, other than writing some custom code to do it. So that's been a big benefit um, for us. And, and it took us a while to get that integration working really well, but it is um, uh, looking, it's, it's doing very well now. Um, so uh, it, one of the questions was, can, uh, the, could I share the modified PMBOK document? Uh, it, it's probably very, well, it's going to be very project methodology based. Um, so our project methodology and how we applied it to the PMBOK model is probably going to be way different than most of the, you know, than a lot of the integrators because your methodology of delivery may be a tad bit different. Now, um, the sections that I, you know, the, the, the basics of what we're after, you know, really don't, uh, they're probably not uh, anything that's, that's too much, uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, secretive to our company. But, but I would definitely say that for the most part, you want it to be your methodology just incorporated into that PMBOK model. And that's what we found to be the, the most successful. And of our four business units, each of us has a different section that's related to that. So if I'm in scope management, my tactics on what we're going to do to manage scope are different than our construction arm, are different than our uh, instrumentation group. So we each have our own tactics there. So that's why I would say it's very much, you know, related to our delivery methodology and the tools that, that we were looking at. So I'm not sure that it would make um, too much sense to, to start with somebody else there, but um, but it is certainly uh, uh, it, it, it was a bit of a challenge to get it put together in the first place. But it, it's absolutely the the one thing that our project management team of all of our companies has rallied around, and we have found a tremendous benefit from uh, having this common terminology. We have projects that we run together as a team that all of our business units are on the same project. And now that we have the same terminology, we all think of it in the same me methodology as well. So it's been a huge help for us. All right, let me see if there's any other questions that I missed here. I don't think so. I think that's all the questions that are on the queue here. I really appreciate you uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, to present today. It's uh, something I've got a great passion for in project management, and I am. I told my boss the other day. I said, "This is the most fun I've had in in my job since I started with the company of building this professional PM team, and we're we're uh, producing some results now that uh, you know it's really going to build us to the next level for you know." Uh, 10 years to the future. Uh, we've, we've got some tools and techniques that we're working through now that are really working well for us. So are we going to go ahead and close this up? And usually it's Bob Lowe, exec, ex, Executive Director of the CSA, who's usually doing this. Uh, he uh, has not been able to join us today due to technical issue. So for the closing, uh, to all of the attendees, thank you for your participation. My hope is that you have several takeaways that will help you improve the area of project management. Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your contribution of your time and expertise. Your presentation was very insightful. We wish you the best for you and interstates. Thanks again to a host and sponsor, John Weber of Software Toolbox. Be sure to complete, complete the survey for today's webinar. It will arrive in your inbox within the hour and take only 30 seconds second to complete. Your feedback is necessary for our continuous improvement. So in closing, here's a brief list of important things. Follow the information on the new standard sales training uh, we provide them for our members. The November newsletter has an article and a link to a survey. Uh, our next webinar in a series is January 29th uh, by Ken Edmondson called People Hiring, Leading, Coaching, and 
evaluation. Don't miss it. And finally, if you have a suggested topic for a webinar, include it in your survey comments. Uh, this is Monica Anderson. Thanks again for attending. Goodbye. All right. Goodbye. So I'm going to close, start, stop, stop the recording.